Okay, everybody, greetings and welcome. Um, my name is Andrew David Schiller, and we're going to try to address today is LDN the magic bullet for fibromyalgia. And I just want to make a quick thanks to the LDN Research Trust for putting on this conference and for enabling me to record this in advance because I can't be with you there today live. And special thanks to Linda for all her patience with me. Um, yeah, so is LDN a magic bullet in fibromyalgia? So as we know, LDN's got unique immune modulating and analgesic effects. And in my experience, there's great synergy with other aspects of an integrative approach to pain and inflammatory conditions. I find it especially relevant and helpful in my fibromyalgia. As you probably know, um, most of the meds that doctors give for fibromyalgia don't work. There are a lot of people running around in the world. There are 10 million people in America with fibromyalgia, three to 6% of the world population. It's a huge problem, very disabling. And a lot of people who are really believing the kind of mainstream view that, hey, there's nothing we can do for you to help you. These medications might control your symptoms. Um, that's not my experience. And when I think about medication choices, it seems to me like LDN is probably a better first line agent than Lyrica or Cymbalta because those are not very evidence-based either. <laughs> and we have some small studies with LDN in fibro that seems to show that it helps. And, seem, and to me, it seems like it gets more at the root of the issue than the anti-epileptic drugs. Um, and sometimes it seems like a magic bullet, but in my experience, it's not the case. Um, it's important to me to put things in context of a systems biology approach, and, and it's a functional approach. And we'll talk together about LDN's place in that and, um, and then look at a couple of case studies. So I think we all know the picture of fibromyalgia that people suffer with, widespread pain, fatigue, unrestored, unrestored of sleep, gastrointestinal problems like irritable bowel, cognitive issues, affective problems, neuropathic pain, environmental sensitivity, pelvic pain, cystitis, postural orthopedic, ortho, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is when people stand up and they get dizzy and their heart's racing. So it can be really disabling and like we said, affecting seven to 10 million people just in the US. Um, so let's start with a case study. Naomi, she's 42, a mother of six, exhausted, widespread pain, insomnia, irritable bowel, kind of a classic presentation. Um, her husband works and studies all day. He's emotionally supportive, but he's not really around. He's a busy guy. She's alone at home with the kids, can't keep up, has minimal social support. They live in a small town in the mountains. She has a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. She was seen by a rheumatologist. They worked her up for the normal things, and you know, it's really important to rule out things like thyroid problems and neuropathy and frank inflammatory disorders. She had an elevated sed rate, but she didn't have any other markers, and so the rheumatologists weren't very interested in doing anything for her. Um, the typical meds didn't work. She was overwhelmed and had no knowledge or inc inclination towards self-care. I asked her what she knew about diet and fibromyalgia, and she said, oh, healthy eating, you mean eating whole wheat bread? Uh, which we know is probably not the best thing, and maybe we'll have time to get into that later. Um, <clears throat> so this is not someone who is really has the resources to do lifestyle ish, um, approaches towards fibro. So we started LDN and did a typical titration of a milligram and a half to three milligrams to four and a half milligrams, five to seven days between doses, recommending for nighttime use if possible, but okay to use it in the day if you have persistent insomnia or vivid dreams that keep you awake. That's kind of my standard approach to prescribing LDN for people with chronic pain. Um, cautions about sleep disturbance, like I said. Some people get more pain, some people get headaches, some people get GI symptoms. So it's important just to let patients know about that in advance. And I typically write people for an eight week script that gives them a bunch of one and a half milligram caps and then uh, a month's worth of four and a half milligrams. Because some people don't get to four milligrams right away. Some people have to stop at three for a few weeks until they kind of accustom themselves to it. So what happened with her? She followed up three to four months after starting LDN. She said, doctor, I'm in horrible pain. I'm thinking, oh no. And I asked her, did you take the medicine? She says, yeah. And then what happened? Well, after two weeks on it, I felt normal again and I didn't have fibromyalgia. So I'm like, great, what happened? Why, why, why are you in pain now? She said, well, I ran out of meds and I had to wait to see you to come back in. Okay, so we can look at this case and this happens sometimes, but not usually. So is LDN a magic bullet for fibromyalgia? In my experience, no. 
Um, in my experience, most people aren't cured with LDN, LDN alone. Naomi was an unusual case, but it happens sometimes. It's wonderful and gratifying when someone feels so well with such a simple intervention. And for sure, uh, that can be part of the picture. But in my experience, there's other issues, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, we know the main mechanisms of LDN are improving opioid function, both sensitivity and production of endorphins and enkephalins, and that because of the enkephalins, there's this immune shift and reduction in inflammatory cytokines, which in certain populations seems to have a big impact on chronic pain. Um, what I want to talk about now is kind of fibromyalgia as a model of functional systems illness, where there's multiple systems with different things going on, um, which is typical of things like that I see a lot, chronic pain, headache, fatigue, even inflammatory disorders. Um, and LDN has a powerful influence on certain as aspects and pathways, but is it really a magic bullet? No, not in the old sense of it, but there's a new kind of magic bullet out there, and that's more like a blender that brings different aspects together, that has different sizes and different caps and is individualized towards patients. And um, let's talk about that kind of magic bullet because to me that's what the functional approach is like for fibromyalgia. Let's start just thinking about systems biology. So it's an integrative approach to try to address complex multi-system illness. And the ac academic buzzword is some systems biology and a lot of the big universities in, the, in America have departments of systems biology where they're trying to look at how everything works together. They're looking at complexity and relationship. They're looking at all the reductionist details that modern medicine has developed and looking at them in biological context, how the systems relate. Because on a certain level, we have subsystems, but we have one system. And on a personal level, intrapersonal, cardiovascular, pulmonary, GI, immune, neuro, all of that. Um, and then environmentally, our interpersonal relationships, relationships with society, with the natural world, exposures, and all of that. And really, systems biology is about looking at the whole picture. And the way that I've been taught in a more functional medicine context is understanding how these variables relate to each other over time. And we talk about antecedents, triggers, and mediators. And let's just unpack that, although many of you may have heard about this idea. Um, did I miss a slide here? What happened? No, okay, right. Yeah, so here's the picture of fibromyalgia. And we're going to look at that in terms of system biology. So antecedents, those are foundational issues or principles of the individual's life and function. Things like genetics, early life trauma, early illness, or exposure, lifestyle issues. And then there's triggers, which are transient events or things that happen. They're states that occur, and they shift the system. They can modify gene expression and metabolism. They can in instill new beliefs in a person or emotions or behavior. You know, in the course of a person's life, the things we go through. And for sure, a lot of us have heard of many people with fibromyalgia have some sort of traumatic trigger or inflammatory immune trigger, and then they develop the illness. So we'll unpack that a little bit. Mediators are more enduring states or even traits that perpetuate or feed the phenotype. These are the things that keep a person sick, and so there can be metabolic things. Um, yeah, like inflammation or lung disease or anemia or chronic distress or adrenal dysregulation. There can be mental emotional things like anxiety or depression, social issues like isolation or discrimination or poverty, and behavioral issues like substance abuse, diet, insomnia. These are mediators. Exercise regularly, good health habits. These are mediators, things that could keep a person sick or keep them healthy. And then we study the flow of information in the system over time. So fibromyalgia can get overwhelming and confusing when we really start looking at the details of what modern science is telling us because mainstream medical science doesn't really have a clear picture of what's going on and that's why there's so much confusion and the, and the mainstream view is fibromyalgia is incurable, it's just all about central sensitization um, <clears throat> and, then, and sure we know there's connections with early trauma and genetics and that people get disabled and deconditioned. The newer medical literature talks about other issues that seem to show up in people with fibromyalgia. For instance, 
oxidative stress and inflammation, both peripheral inflammation and central inflammation. And of course, we're talking about low-grade inflammation with altered inflammatory cytokine profiles and activation of glial cells in the brain. Glial cells are like the support cells for your brain, somewhat like macrophages, and they get hot and bothered in fibro and other central pain states, and they secrete abundant inflammatory cytokines, and that seems to be part of what generates central pain sensitivity, which we know is one of the issues in fibromyalgia. But you don't need to have an elevated sed rate or a C-reactive protein to have these things going on, um, and we don't really have ways of clinically measuring them. They measure them in research. I think an un unenlightened, oh wait, and so we go further and we have hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and I put the T there for thyroid because the whole hormonal system is all interrelated and connected. And, um, and these are some of the hormonal issues that we see in people with fibro that seem to, to fit into the whole picture. Um, there's mitochondrial dysfunction. As with a lot of chronic degenerative diseases, mitochondria, the cellular energy production warehouses that actually are power plants for our cells, they get dysfunctional. Our cells don't produce energy. And that's part of why people with fiber see, probably get their fatigue and chronic pain and they do a little bit of activity and they go beyond their aerobic uh, threshold and their bodies start producing lactic acid and they get all this pain and they flare up from that. Um, and then, of course, sleep disturbance and gastrointestinal dysfunction, which tend to get thought of as symptoms in mainstream medicine. But in a functional model, we understand that they're part of what perpetuates fibro. I think an unlightened medical approach would look at all this and say, uh, okay, so what do I do about that? How do I fix those things? Is there a single cause that we can treat, or can I give a pill for each one of those things? And my sense is that in the medical press and the popular press about fibro, you see this persistent um, search for what's the single cause. So a researcher finds a physiologic change in fibromyalgia and wants to say, here's the cause. You know, for instance, recently um, there's been some research showing that combining an NSAID, an anti-inflammatory, along with an antiviral uh, helps a lot of people with fibromyalgia and so people are running around and saying oh this is the cure because fibromyalgia is caused by herpes simplex virus so we've found the cure and the cause and to me that seems kind of silly I don't know if anyone's ever proven this premise that there needs to be one cause that's something that we developed out of the modern bacteria antibiotic era with one disease has one cause and one treatment um, but the picture that seems to be emerging in the literature to me is that we've got multiple different physiologic dysfunctions in fibromyalgia that can come about through various triggers, various genetic predispositions, various moderating factors that are going on in that person's life. And my sense is that we'll be further along towards improving diagnosis and treatment if we stopped looking for one cause and started looking at it as a complex systems dysfunction. So how does mainstream medicine think about fibro and what to do? This is just from the Mayo Clinic on their website. Great place, amazing. Obviously the best, one of the best institutions in the world. But basically, researchers believe that fibromyalgia amplifies painful sensations by affecting the way your brain processes pain signals. Okay, we know that. We call that centralization, central sensitization creating widespread pain. The question is why? What creates central sensitization? Research has progressed. I don't know why they're not talking about this so much, but it's pretty clear that there's glial activation, that there is inflammation, both central and peripheral, that's driving changes in brain function. And that's not just in fibromyalgia, it's also in complex regional pain syndrome. We see that in chronic peripheral neuropathy. There's a set, we even see it, I think, starting in osteoarthritis. I'm not sure if we got research to show that, but clearly there's a central pain component there. And the common thread is that we've got activation of central inflammatory um, responses in the brain that part of what sensitizes the brain. Um, so there's more to it though, because we've also got research showing hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, stress overdrive. We'll unpack this more in a moment, but that's part of what seems to create central sensitization. Um, as we know from the fact that so many people who've got early life stressors and adverse childhood events tend to have chronic pain syndromes in a much higher percentage than other populations. Sleep disturbance is an intimate bed partner, so to speak, with chronic stress response. They feed into each other. And as any 
medical doctor could probably tell you after working a 36 hour shift in the in ICU or in the ER or whatever it is, I don't know about the rest of you, but I always felt like a wreck. And if I miss a night's sleep, I'm aching the next day. And so it's not so hard to see a connection between sleep disturbance and central sensitization. Finally, mitochondrial dysfunction is part of this picture too. Okay, so let's unpack things a little bit more, right? And let's start with this stress axis, the overall stress response, because to me it seems like that's a really key issue. Uh, I say that in part because it seems to be part of the presentation of every one of my patients with fibromyalgia, and part because it so, so clearly feeds into these vicious cycles of physiologic changes. So we understand that genetics and early life trauma can be part of the picture. Um, people with fibromyalgia have a higher incidence of genetic polymorphisms that are involved in breakdown of stress hormones and catecholamines. And so it seems like there's a predisposition there to having an overabundant stress response that doesn't shut off because the body doesn't break down the epinephrine and norepinephrine so quickly. Um, so that feeds into this constellation of things. And so I'm just drawing a picture that's connecting mental emotional stress, adrenal dysfunction, and sleep disturbance. So, you know, I want to just say one quick thing because we've all heard the term adrenal fatigue. And I think that's a very misleading term and I think it's an unproductive term because the adrenals are not really broken. But we do understand that there is... Um, this normally in health, there is a feedback system between the hypothalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands, and that feedback gets altered in people with fibromyalgia. So there can be distortions in the normal pattern of diurnal um, cortisol secretion, cortisol being one of our main stress hormones for chronic stress. So again, it's not adrenal fatigue but it's more of a distorted feedback system, and that's got huge implications for thyroid hormones, sex hormones, and other signaling systems. Um, it's also interesting because we're starting to see a rich connection among hormonal systems and mitochondria. Um, it turns out that mitochondria, and here's a reference that I got a lot of this from, from Bruce McEwen, who's really kind of one of the big, big guys in stress physiology for decades and decades at Rockefeller. He wrote a beautiful, interesting review. It's really worth looking at. Focus on mitochondria, a view, an energetic view of stress. Um, he's pointing out that our stress hormones and sex hormones, for the most part, are actually synthesized in our mitochondria. And it seems like there's a two-way street where a dysfunction of our stress hormone, of our hormonal axes, is associated with fibro, with uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, and vice versa. His view is that look, stress is an energy-dependent function. A person who's got overabundant stress, an allostatic load, as he calls it, meaning a need to adapt to some sort of thing going on in a person's environment, whether internal or external, <clears throat> naturally you need energy for that. And so energy production in our, in our mitochondria are intimately connected with our um, hormonal axis. And so let's not collect, forget how these things are connected to behavioral dysregulation. Research is showing over and over that the desire for fatty, sugary comfort foods is a physiologically integrated with stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. And other behaviors like smoking and other substance abuse can also be part of the picture. And so finally, uh, just acknowledging that pain itself and the other symptoms of fibro are part of the cycle because pain is a distress signal and pain is something that stimulates core limbic aspect parts of our limbic system that tell us that there's danger that we need to get up and go and do something and and we know that the stress system when it's activated worsens and intensifies pain transmission so let's look at this in other contexts too like here again is the same hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis with our genetic and early trauma influences on it and when we think about it in terms of a mitochondria We've got what seems like to me a relevant connection to one of the comical, common clinical observations in fibro. Because what I've heard from so many patients over the years is, okay, I'm living my busy, busy, go, go life. I had some difficult early life experiences, but I was tough and strong and I was a perfectionist and I worked hard and I went to nursing school or medical school or I got a business degree and I was working, working, working. And they describe kind of an energy, uh, energy go, 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 energizer bunny lifestyle 
and life gets more complicated and the stress load increases and most people are not paying attention to the level of stress. It's happening, they're habituating to it and they're just living a stressed out life and going and going and here's adrenal stress over time. And there's this gradual crescendo of adrenal hyperfunction and then there's a trigger event and that could be a car accident or a surgery or falling down and hitting their head or some kind of stressful life, life event or a really bad illness and then there's this pulse of stress followed by a crash. And in that crash, there's what looks like adrenal hypofunction. And that's where this whole adrenal fatigue language seems to have come out of. But we really understand it to be, like I said before, is dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which I'm just gonna call HPA going forward because it's a mouthful. Um, and, and if we put this together with our studying of, of mitochondria, we're adding a level of dynamism to this whole system, right? When, when systems get more complicated, they get more susceptible to having extreme shifts in function when there's big perturbations in that system. So just picturing someone who's got an increased HPA, HPA axis and adrenal function over time, and then suddenly there's a huge boost of it, which potentially, I'm proposing, creates a breakdown in mitochondrial function, which creates a br further breakdown in HPA axis function, and you get this vicious cycle and boom, maybe that's part of what causes people's crash. It's hard to know, we're gonna have to do more measurement. Let's keep going and look a bit more in a little bit more detail about some of the other aspects of these vicious cycles of what seems to be giving rise to and perpetuating fibromyalgia syndrome. So <clears throat> this is kind of an overall picture of our gut-brain axis from a 2017 article about the influence of the microbiome on um, neurotransmitters and affective disorders. And most of you have seen this, but just to briefly explain what's going on here, here's your brain, here's your vagus nerve. Your vagus nerve is this big nerve that comes out of the base of your skull and goes and feeds all of your viscera. Your vagus nerve is a huge aspect of the relaxation response. It's your big um, parasympathetic nerve <clears throat> and so when there's vagal dysfunction when there's a decrease in vagal tone there's actually an increase or overactive stress response vagal tones connected so profoundly to what's going on in your intestine this is the lumen the the barrier of the intestine this is what's inside your intestine gazillions or actually trillions of bacteria more than human cells we've learned that the biome of all of these bacteria has a huge impact not only on what's going on in your gut in terms of producing neurotransmitters and various other chemicals that can involve, be involved with gut inflammation and the health of this uh, mucus and, and cellular barrier, um, but creates a barrier between that and the, the immune system and all the vasculature that surrounds your intestines. But there's also feedback from the vagus, a sensory feedback that goes up to the brain that affects mood, that affects behavior, that affects so many aspects of our functioning. And yes, our hypothalamic pituitary axis in, in also. <clears throat> so, so basically there's three main things that go on when we get dysregulation of our vagal function, when we get overactive stress response, we get a change in our biome, we get breakdown in that intestinal barrier, and we get changes in our intestinal motility. Irritable bowel syndrome is a change in intestinal motility. Let's pl plug this back into our mind-body dysfunction because it's so deeply in interconnected and just unpack it a little bit. We saw, okay, HPA axis stress response and gut-brain axis changes. Yeah, we know about that, but let's unpack that. There's motility issues, barrier issues, biome issues. We understand that the biome feeds back into your brain and affects mood and affects behavior and a lot of other things. We understand that when the barrier breaks down and we get leaky gut or intestinal permeability, it can generate systemic inflammation. And systemic inflammation can generate central inflammation and that can generate glial activation and pain syndromes like we talked about before. S systemic inflammation obviously feeding back not only into pain but into mood and affect and behavior. And then irritable bowel, motility issues, changing people's diets, inability to absorb nutrients when a person eats food and has to run to the bathroom in 10 minutes, their gut motility is enhanced, so they can't absorb nutrients. There's potential for malabsorption there, though I haven't seen any studies showing that yet. So let's look at the big picture here again, and let's try to 
put the whole picture together and think about, well, where is LDN likely to be helpful in fibromyalgia? And we're almost done with all these complex physiology slides, so bear with me. This is the most important one, so try to bring your attention to this one, okay? So we start with this foundation of genetics and early life experiences and trauma, which can affect our overall inclination towards inflammation and oxidative stress through various pathways. And a key aspect of that is their relation, both directions, with mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and inflammation. They feed into each other. Oxidative stress and inflammation generates mitochondrial dysfunction. When the mitochondria are dysfunctional, they generate reactive oxygen species, and that's a vicious cycle. And that itself could start to stimulate a lot of the symptoms we see in fibromyalgia. Pain, brain fog, affective disturbances, fatigue, these are all associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. Going forward, we understand we talked about um, central sensitization, glial activation, which are in, related to inflammation systemically and related to mitochondrial dysfunction. Because when the mitochondria in the brain get dysfunctional, the glia get activated. And when the glia get dysfunctional, it's part of the vicious cycle here. And then we're looking at here stealth infections and our biome and GI issues. We didn't really talk about the stealth infection thing, very controversial topic, but some people seem to have low-grade infections that maybe be contributing to low-grade uh, systemic inflammation that feed into all of these other changes in fibro. Let's not forget about biochemistry and toxicity. Things like heavy metal exposure, chemotherapy exposure, these are massive oxidative stressors. They put a huge load on the system. And putting back in and plugging in our HPA axis and thyroid dysfunction, and like we talked about, that feeds into the whole system. Um, so we're coming to the main point of this slide. What's the role of LDN? If we think about our main understanding of LDN, we've got shifting in our pain transmission because it enhances opioid production. And there's also an aspect of effect on our, on our infl inflammatory pathways. I'm sorry, for, I forgot to talk about or just put in this last connection of our stress response as it affects central sensitization and the stress response as it affects our GI function. And so what I'm trying to clarify here is just that we've got multiple different systems that are affected and get dysfunctional in people with fibromyalgia. And LDN, at least in its putative effects, tends to work the most in terms of on our inflammation, glial activation, and central sensitization. Um, but I want to suggest that the, the, the picture might be a little bit more complex than that because LDN enhances opioid function. And our opioid system, our endorphins and our enkephalins, affect all the systems of our body. And so just an example, we talked about sleep dysfunction as it relates to HPA axis. I had somebody come to me about five months ago, I guess, with horrible fibromyalgia, chronic widespread pain, a little bit of sleep dysfunction. She wasn't really saying that was a huge issue. Um, again, this was someone who didn't have a lot of interest or pre-education about doing positive lifestyle things. So we started with LDN and then also some osteopathy because she had some structural issues, especially around some mild head trauma. And she came back to me two weeks later for an osteopathic treatment after starting LDN. She said, doctor, I'm sleeping 15 hours a day. I can't wake up in the morning. <laughs> and my response was, can you work that into your life? And she said, yeah, I can work around it. I'm, I'm self-employed. I said, you know, maybe you just need to sleep 15 hours a day for a while. And she slept 15 hours a day for like two months. And then her sleep came back to a normal rhythm. And that was associated with such a profound improvement. Um, there may be issues with LDN affecting other aspects of our system, our HPA axis. There may be aspects of it shifting things like oxidative stress. Um, and even for sure, we know that there's implications for our gastrointestinal symptoms and, and uh, improvements in GI motility. And a lot of people with IBS improve when they get LDN. So there's broad, broad application, but the system is broader and more complex. Okay, so that was a lot of information and just changing gears. Um, I want to introduce you to one of my friends. I was just sitting out next to this wall up above the Dead Sea eating some salad and uh, this character just showed up. It's kind of like he blinked himself into existence. He just popped up. It's an Ibex 
and these things do these incredible like acrobatic running up and down hillsides and it seems they can jump 15 feet in a single bound and he just kind of popped up and they're so calm these creatures they just sit there and look at you and then when they figure out that you're not a tree they can eat they seem to turn their heads and walk in a different direction and look for something to eat cute right okay so let's just one more time visit the complex physiology and I want to just express why and how we think about this whole thing in terms of antecedents, triggers, and mediators because that whole map of physiology can be very overwhelming. When I first started thinking that way years and years ago, before I started formally studying functional medicine, my brain was just exploding with every patient I saw. And the, the antecedents, triggers, and mediators approach is really helpful because it lets us think about each patient and try to see what's driving the issue. So here's what's going on. I have some with fibromyalgia. They've got some combination of the usual symptoms of pain, sleep disturbance, fatigue, GI, cognitive, affective, other. And I'm going to make a map, and I'm going to think about antecedents, triggers, and mediators. Antecedents are things like genetics and early trauma or illness or exposures or lifestyle. And triggers are things like trauma, illness, viral, toxic, infectious. And I suspect that anyone out there who sees a bunch of people with fibromyalgia, if you start asking the question, you start going to hear you're you're going to hear that there's a trigger in a large number of patients where they had some sort of this is when it happened, right? And it could be a trauma, and it could be a viral disease, or some sort of toxic or chemical exposure. It could be a emotional, mental stress, loss of a loved one, and. People will report, yeah, that's when it all started. My life hasn't been the same since then. And that often gives us a clue in terms of where to focus on what we're doing. Because if that insult was infectious, then we want to think about immune. We want to think about whether that infectious agent is still around. I had a patient who came to me who got really sick with some sort of parasite in Asia and comes back to me five years later with horrible widespread fatigue and all kinds of symptoms. And we did a workup and they, she still had a parasite. She had a worm. And so that was generating chronic inflammation. Um, antecedents, people who have asthma and they take their adenoids out and they take their tonsils out and you know there's clearly like an immune um, infectious thing going on early on in life and frequently you check their biome with some sort of gastrointestinal check testing and they're all out of whack with dysbiosis and so that's a focal point of treatment. Finally mediators, things that are going non now that may be perpetuating uh, the problem and that's where the antecedents and triggers lead you to look to ask, well, what might be perpetuating and keeping this person sick? Is it profound ongoing stress and interpersonal abuse or trauma? Is there some sort of inflammatory driver? Um, is it just the central sensitization feeding into their stress? Are their mitochondria tanked out? Do they have really bad um, cortisol axis and they're not producing any cortisol or they're cortisol response is flipped over and they're producing too much at night and not enough during the day so they're exhausted at day but can't wake up at night and these are things that are treatable with appropriate approaches which we don't have time to go into right now but the point I'm trying to make is that we create a flow chart and we try to see and determine what might be contributory and in addition to LDN if I elect to use that in a given patient what else do I need to be thinking about so looking at those vicious cycles Okay, so let's change gears now, and we're going to run through for a few cases just that have been illustrated to me about some of the issues of using LDN in this population. So first, Annette, another case here, Angela. I'm in subtitling it, can I please have my brain back? So Angela is a lovely person. She comes in, she's 55. She's got severe fibromyalgia with high disability scores, widespread pain, sleep disturbance, IBS, the usual. She had chronic pain for years, but it really got worse in the last four years after she had a family tragedy. Now she went and saw a naturopath and got a really complex diet and supplement regimen with all the things that you might think are relevant to fibromyalgia, but she didn't do any of it. And when I was talking with Angela, one of the main things that, that struck it from the exam was she seemed kind of tired and floaty and had trouble paying attention and I sort of did a little intervention and I discussed fibromyalgia pathophysiology and how to treat it in the context of her history for about 15 minutes. And I asked her what she understood from the conversation. And she wasn't retaining anything at all. 
And so her brain was so dysfunctional and her attention was so dysfunctional that she couldn't comply with the treatment plan. And my concern was that maybe she wouldn't even be able to know how to take the LDN. So with her, with Angela, I encouraged her to enroll in an online body skill, uh, mind-body skills course that I give. Relaxation, mindfulness, emotional self-awareness, mind retraining according to a particular map of, uh, that I share based on my own spiritual tradition, and group support. And just to see what happened just from that intervention, um, I've started getting an FIQ, a fibromyalgia impact, uh, impact questionnaire revised on all of my patients. It's got three scores. The first one's about function. The second one's about overall dysfunction. And the third one's about subjective symptoms, about a bunch of different symptoms. And high score is bad, low score is good. Here's how Angela showed up before the course, where she had dysfunction level of 72 out of 90, meaning like she couldn't prepare a meal and clean herself and take a shower and do things around the house described herself as profoundly disabled and profoundly overwhelmed and had really se severe symptom severity scores. She spent eight weeks in the course and met with me about three weeks afterwards and redid the FIQ and look what happened to her dysfunction score. She still had really high symptom severity. So still a lot of pain, a lot of stiffness, a lot of fatigue, but she got her brain back from retraining her HPA axis from retraining her stress response and for developing, developing skills for coping with the challenging things. Part of what we do in the course is not just going to a calm place inside, which is vastly important and powerful for many people, but it's also about noticing what are the triggers in one's own experience in the course of the days and weeks that take me out of that calm place? What are the places in my experience, in my life personally, intrapersonally, that create stress and take me off of my, my, uh, my groove? So that had a profound impact on her. And she loved her new brain. And then we started on fibromyalgia. And here's her scores before fibro. She was doing a lot better, so we did standard dosing. And then after she was on fibro for, I think it was about eight weeks, she came back. And her symptom severity cut in half. So kind of a double whammy we did here. I looked at her and I said, look, there's a huge brain dysfunction, brain fog, sympathetic overdrive thing going on. Let's try to address that first. And I think she's going to get a bigger impact from everything else we do. And after this, we went on to do some of the things around exercise and diet and nutrition. <clears throat> Just a slight sort of going back into pathophysiology, the degree to which the mind-body issue and overactive stress response and hypothalamic pituitary adrenal thyroid dysfunction feeds into all these other issues like gut-brain axis and immune activation, mitochondrial dysfunction and pain pathway sensitization. But my sense is that it's so vital with this population to really get the mind-body axis healthier to take an approach and do some kind of intervention that's empowering, that gives some freedom of choice, some degree of self-efficacy, a sense of coherence and understanding, and the capacity for transformation, for meeting difficult circumstances that might have once been overwhelming, and giving skills and confidence for dealing with them effectively. And so my goal in the course that I gave is giving people a calm, clear mind, teaching them to be compassionate and forgiving of themselves, but also discerning and aware and giving them a map of consciousness so they can kind of understand what's going on inside of them, teaching them to be responsive rather than reactive. Reactive is the automatic stress response. Responsive is choosing how to be in response to a difficult situation. And sometimes for some people, spiritual connection is profoundly important. And then fostering healing attitudes like joy, generosity, um, focused desire. In my tradition, desire, when we connect to our core and we know what we really want and we're actually living purpose, that is resilience. You may have heard of Viktor Frankl who survived the, the concentration camps. I think he was in Auschwitz. And he chronicled the people who were successful dealing with such unbelievably challenging situations. And it's the ones who had purpose, the ones who decided that despite being in hell, they were going to be human those are the ones who seem to survive better. And so 
giving people back their humanity. They've got a disease, they've got hopelessness, they've been shamed and blamed by their doctors and family members, it's so challenging. And giving them back a capacity to connect to who they are and what they care about, it's profound what it does for them. Gratitude, trust, life skills, yeah. These are obviously all very exper experiential things we can talk about from blue to, to blue in the face. Uh, but feeling it and knowing it is really the thing. And that's what I try to give over to people when I do that training. And there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, let's change, go, go back to cases a little bit, right? Um, I could talk all day about mindfulness and practical spiritual development and why it's helpful, but this is the LDA, LDN conference, so let's focus on that. So Richard, because this, this was a great case for me. This is when I first started using LDN. He comes in with a lot of fatigue and a little bit of pain. Mainly it was fatigue. And he had numerous immune and biome issues. He was a premature infant, got a lot of antibiotics, asthma. He got fibro after a bad flu, and I put him on standard dosing, one and a half, three, four point five milligrams every five days, increase the dose. And he calls me two, four days into it, and he says, I am so wiped out, I can't function, the pain's killing me, what have you done to me? So humbling, I just fell on my face on this one. Um, poor guy. So I learned to do something differently. And when I see someone who's really dysfunctional in terms of fatigue, or really sensitive uh, in terms of pain symptoms. Um, this isn't just about fatigue. I saw someone recently with a really bad kind of migraine equivalent where when he gets overstimulated, he gets these attacks where he can't speak and his, just gets brain to function, has to lie down and kind of close his eyes, put in earplugs, dark room, turn off all the electronics, can't stand electromagnetic fields. So for that kind of situation as well, environmental sensitivity, I tend to start at half a milligram and then go in half milligram increments every week. And I give them very careful instructions about waiting at quote unquote your best dose. Because some people find that they go up to, in his case, he went to two and a half milligrams and he started feeling a bit better. When he went to three, he started getting overwhelmed and fatigued and having pain again. So he stopped at two and a half for a couple of months. And then after that, he was able to increase and went up to four milligrams and had continued benefit. And so the people, and that I think from my understanding is that's often the case with people who have chronic fatigue, people who have really bad fatigue with multiple sclerosis. They need to find the right dose. Um, I actually had someone who came in who I started on a half milligram and that was too much. So we went down to a quarter and that's what worked for her and helped her start to kind of climb out of the hole that she was in, so to speak, in terms of her physiologic dysfunction. Um, next case, Faith, and I'm speaking about this one. She's really kind of a complex multiple, multiple, multiple medical issue thing going on here. Um, yeah, she's 47 year old, severe fibromyalgia with a high pain and, and disability scores. And I'm sorry I wrote psoriatic arthritis here without active joints. She actually had a lupus diagnosis, it was my mistake, sorry about that. In any event, obesity, hypertension on two meds, elevated inflammatory markers, she had had a DVT, she was hypercoagulable with an MHDFR and was on uh, uh, anticoagulant. And um, anxiety, depression, long medication list. We, one of the first things we did was fibro, I mean LDN at standard doses and that helped her a lot. She had a significantly more energy after just about eight weeks and she was able to stop her antihypertensive medications and stop her antidepressants so really improving medically but still with a lot of pain and fatigue and um, really disabled from it I'm sorry not sorry mainly it was pain not fatigue so what now um, that's when we got biochemical and tried to address some of the issues in terms of her significant gut dysfunction as well as what I saw to be both central sensitization and mitochondrial dysfunction. So she did the mind-body program, and then we did supplements for mitochondrial function, methyl donors, because people who have MHTFR dysfunctions can often have issues with neurotransmitter synthesis. They can have issues with detoxification. Um, so these are some of the things we did for her. And I often work with a health coach in complex patients like this, because even when they have a good brain that functions well, it's really hard to make change. And especially this person who had a little bit of OCD, it was really helped to, helpful to put her in touch with a coach who helped her gradually, gently, compassionately make changes and support her practice and, um, 
and kind of workable chunks of her lifestyle plan. So that was associated with some improvement and she was feeling better and had more mobility. And then we started working on movement in a mindful context. And mindful context means within threshold because when mitochondria aren't functioning, when I don't have enough cortisol to drive my system, I've got a low threshold. And that to me seems to be the issue with the normal exercise recommendations. You know, a person with fibro who goes out and tries to do what they used to do and run a mile is gonna be wiped out and fatigued or even trying to clean their house or whatever it is. So they've gotta find what's their threshold and they've gotta have the compassion and the presence to know when they're getting to it and walk half a block. And if that feels good, do it again. And then next, after doing that every day, walk a block and a half. We know exercise improves mitochondrial function, but you gotta do it at the right, eight, right rate. I'm a big fan of yoga, tai chi, Feldenkrais, Pilates, because there's an instructional methodology there. If it's done with the right teacher, where it's gradual and it's gentle and it's mindful and you can start slow and build. So that's it for me today. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for being here. And um, I wish you all lots of success uh, working with your patients with LDN, with fibromyalgia, and uh, wishing you all the best.